So we're really excited today because we're not just in Two Rivers, but we are traveling to New York. Um, and we have a curatorial tour of Poster House's latest exhibition, uh, Julius Klinger. It's Posters for a Modern Age, and it's with chief curator Angelina Lippert. Which means if you like 20th century graphic design, you are in for a treat today. Um, the show is on display at the Poster House from March 4th to August 15th of this year. And uh, we are really excited because Angelina does such an amazing job of sharing what's in their collection there. I, I love it. I love your videos. I think it's a really wonderful way to share what's in a collection because it's something we do here at Hamilton is consider how we tell the story. And um, she does a, an amazing job of making collections accessible and learning more about the past. Um, she is the chief curator of the Poster House in New York City. She holds an MA in the Art of Russian Avant-Garde from Courtauld Institute of Art in London and a BA in the Theology and Art History from Smith College. She's the author of the Art Deco Poster. And if you don't know about the Poster House, uh, they do amazing things. They're dedicated to presenting the impact, culture, and design of posters, both as historical documents and methods of contemporary visual communication. And as the first poster museum in the United States, Poster House provides a space for inquiry for all those interested in design, advertising, and public um, interventions with an aim to improving design literacy among the general public. In fact, one of their recent exhibitions included the letterpress posters of Amos Kennedy. Uh, I know, so you guys were official, we're in poster museums. So uh, I want to say thank you again, Angelina, for joining us today. We're so excited um, and we really, really can't wait to hear more about what you're gonna share. Awesome, thank you so much, Stephanie. Yeah. Um, so as she said, I'm Angelina Lippert, Chief Curator of Poster House. Um, now, if you haven't been to Poster House before, as Stephanie said, we're the first and only museum in the United States dedicated to the art and history of the poster. We just opened in 2019 in the Flatiron District of Manhattan. Uh, and today we have on three wildly different shows that you can catch in person between now and August 15th. So I am going to share my screen so you, I can start talking about some of them. Um, Stephanie, do you see images? We see images. Awesome. Uh, so the first uh, show that I'm gonna talk about very briefly before I get into the cleaner stuff um, is a small hallway show that when you first enter the space, uh, it's called Vera List and the Posters of Lincoln Center. Uh, it explores the impetus and history behind Lincoln Center's rather revolutionary artist-driven subway campaign of the 1960s. This is in the spot where um, Amos Kennedy's show was at, at our museum. So during the pandemic, we, we had, prior to the pandemic, we had gotten all this feedback that people wanted um, more rather than we had a giant gallery upstairs and a smaller gallery downstairs. So I was like, all right, let's turn spaces that were never meant to be museum spaces into areas of display. So we activated this very, it's short, so it can fit maybe seven to 10 posters. So it's a tight little space um, right when you walk in. And, um, and so I, I was like, I know Amos, I can get Amos to do something for us. So that's what we opened with. And then we followed that up with this show. Um, downstairs right now, we have a show called Freak Power uh, that explores Hunter S. Thompson's campaign for Sheriff of Aspen in 1970 and the subsequent grassroots political movement that built up around his political efforts. Uh, it features posters by Thomas Benton and that you can see here, obviously, as well as illustrations by Ralph Stedman. And then finally, the, uh, the main event today, we have on view Julius Klinger, Posters for a Modern Age. Uh, it's on loan to us from the Wolfsonian in Miami Beach, Florida. But if you'd seen that show, it's very different. I rewrote the entire show since our space is very different than the Wolfsonian's. So while there was, theirs was grouped rather thematically, ours is very linear. Um, now I'm gonna give you a version of the tour I do in person at the museum. So please jump in with questions in the chat uh, and let me know what you think. I'm obviously not gonna hit on every poster in the show because that would take three hours. Um, and, uh, and if you have any other questions after I leave, you can always email me. I'm always on email. Um, so please hit me up with your questions. So I normally start by saying that Julius Klinger didn't go to art school. Uh, he went to technical school. And I think that really influences how he approaches poster design. So unlike a lot of poster artists where they kind of insert their voice or style into the design of the poster, Klinger is always changing his method to um, a composition, sort of approaching design from the perspective of an engineer. Um, he's solving a problem through graphic design. 
And that's why I think that if you look at his body of work from start to finish, it's incredibly varied. Um, so if you look at a Mucha or a Latrec or a Capiello, you can pretty easily identify them no matter where they are in their careers. One Mucha looks just like another Mucha. Klinger's style, on the other hand, changes drastically and often. And I think that's also why he's been kind of relegated to the sidelines of poster history. Uh, he's not easy to pick up out of a lineup and he's isn't really able to be boxed into a single style. So here you see a poster from an early part of his career on the left. Um, it's for what essentially translates to the bad boys ball or the ball of the naughty boys. Uh, literally a party where adults dressed up as children. There, there are photos that exist of this like annual event where people my age um, are in like diapers and little doll dresses. And um, not to kink shame anyone, but damn, if you think you're weird, these guys are really weird. Um, so then on the right is a poster from the end of his career that's so minimal, so reduced, but also so clever because the O of Ostreich or Germany, I'm sorry, not Austria, not Germany, uh, is essentially turned into a face that's like screaming at you to play the lottery thanks to those like umlauts as eyes. Uh, so Mucha's consistency, Klinger is not. Now, Klinger, I mentioned that he went to trade school rather than art school. So while that's true, he also studied privately under Gustav Klimt and Coleman Moser, who founded the Vienna Secession. Uh, so Jugendstil isn't a far leap from that, uh, which is the style his early career is most often associated with. Although obviously, as I just showed you, he evolves rather quickly from that style. So I'm a really big fan of this early poster by Klinger advertising the summer edition of a satirical magazine. So most poster designers at the turn of the century kind of began their career as cartoonists. So Capiello, even Lautrec to some extent. So that economy of expression and the ability to create bold graphics is certainly a byproduct of that fact. Uh, here, Klinger is promoting a magazine that literally translates as funny pages um, by showcasing two centaurs uh, dressed in bathing attire out for a sensible day at the beach fishing. Now I was giving a tour the other day and someone asked, well, like why would Klinger choose centaurs to promote this publication? Um, and the answer is actually like, why not? Um, so as you'll soon see, Klinger is a bit of a weirdo. Um, he also knows that the point of a poster is to catch someone's attention in under a second. If a poster can't do that, it's failed. Um, and if I'm walking down the street in Berlin and I see two centaurs fishing, I certainly would do a double take and try to figure out what on earth is being advertised to me. I also absolutely love, love, love this poster. Uh, but before I tell you what it is, I wanna ask everyone to make a guess in your head about what is being shown. Now, obviously, if you can read the German, you have a slight advantage uh, in that you know it says costume rental, but I'm not sure that actually helps you determine what sort of costume it is. Um, he's a chicken. Uh, yes, that little, that little beak on his nose, it's a beak, um, and all those weird multicolored egg shapes, those are feathers and it's chicken. Um, so carnival is a serious business um, and costumes are always needed. And you can, you too can become this chicken um, if so you choose. Uh, so I love this poster. Now, before we move on to the middle portion of Klinger's career, I wanna stop for a second on this poster because it understores Klinger's really weird and wicked and quirky sense of humor. So at this time, posters advertising things like pasteurized milk or water or anything like that would typically use imagery of a mother feeding it or giving it to their child. Uh, so it, it, it emphasizes the product is safe, it's clean, it's pure. So Klinger kind of takes it a step further uh, and advertises mineral water, a product that incidentally Bonacqua is still sold by Coca-Cola today, um, by showing a mama frog feeding the water to her baby frog, which is kind of weird and also really funny. Now, I want to take you to my favorite poster in the show, which is Klinger's image for Gerber cigarettes on the left. We actually bought this poster because I wanted it to be in the show so badly. Now, poster designers all kind of knew of if they didn't know each other directly. Um, and the poster community was pretty small. Um, so collectors obtained things across borders and shared them. So Klinger was very much aware of Steinlin, who created the poster on the right. Steinlin also did the Chat Noir poster of like the black cat with the halo that everyone knows. Now, when the Stylin poster on the right came out, it was considered a bit saucy, a bit scandalous uh, because it was interpreted as being pretty homoerotic. 
uh, two dudes, one much wealthier, sharing a cigarette under a lamppost at night. I know we probably wouldn't read it like that today, but there are plenty of written accounts of how this image was perceived at the time. And Klinger was aware of this poster and was essentially like, hold my beer. Um, he created the Gerber cigarettes poster of a satyr and a centaur gazing deeply into each other's eyes, millimeters apart, sharing a smoke. And he's like, you want homoerotic? I've got weird homoerotic. Um, I love the detail of like the little fly on the centaur's flanks that he's about to like swoosh off with his little fluffy little tail. And I just think it's a great composition. Um, now people, uh, people also often ask about the production process and obviously you guys like printing. Um, well, companies, let's say like I want to start Angelina's coffee shop. Um, I would typically go to a printer, like one of you all, and I would say, um, I need a poster and what can you do for me? And they'd give me a bunch of like visual options and some type treatments. I'd sort of like mix and match and come up with something. Um, there was another printer in Berlin at that time named Hallerbaum and Schmidt. And they were like the cool different printer to go to. Um, they had the best inks and by best, I mean that they were more light resistant and water resistant than what other companies offered. Their papers were stronger than typical poster paper at that time. So their work lasted longer on the streets and just generally looked better. They also had like the great idea of rather than doing this sort of mix and match approach where everything looked the same, they would hire the best graphic designers and kind of like let them run wild with any assignment. And by the sheer fact that all of their output was like bright and wild and varied and so different, um, that would make someone walking down the street be like, oh, if it looks like that, it's got to be printed by Hallerbaum and Schmidt because no one else would produce something like that. And here Klinger has made, in my opinion, two very different posters advertising the printer he worked for. Um, so the left poster, that script at the top says placat, uh, don't ask me how that's a P. Um, and the figure there with the red ears, that's actually Klinger um, being slowly enveloped by like red and blue rings. Again, don't ask me what that's supposed to be a metaphor for. Now on the right is a much larger poster. It's a two sheet poster. So you can see the, the seam running through the middle. It's also advertising Hallerbaum and Schmidt. And here Klinger shows his knowledge of Japanese prints. Uh, the pattern of the dress is very common to textiles that were coming out of the Wiener Werkstatt. Um, the idea of the new woman, which I'll talk about later. Um, it's way more modern than the one on the left, but they're only like a few years apart. Um, and they're advertising the exact same thing. Um, also, I love pointing out that in real life tours that Klinger's signature uh, is different in every poster. Uh, he never uses the same signature twice, which again is something very unusual in, in poster history. Now here are two other ads he did for Holler Von Schmidt. So the one on the left is essentially a magazine ad. It's like very tiny in a, in a little book. Um, and the one on the right actually isn't in the show, but they both use the same idea, so that's why I'm showing them. Um, so you can see on the left that he's put his coworkers' names, as well as his own, on all of those two cats. And on the right are those cacti, those are portraits of all of his coworkers. Now, would you make weird portraits of your colleagues to use as the official ad for your business? It's a weird choice. Um, we incidentally do have the cactus poster on a mug in the gift shop if anyone's like dying to drink their coffee out, out of a bunch of pricks, but um, that's what I do in the morning. Now, with the advent of World War I, Klinger returns to Austria, which is where he's from, he's not German, um, and then he gets what I believe is his most important commission, uh, because it's really a high point in his career and totally shows his breadth of style. So Taboo, which is a cigarette rolling paper company, hires him to do their poster campaign. Now, all of the posters I'm about to show you are from the same year. All would have been on the streets simultaneously. We have photos showing them on the streets all together. Um, now, looking at these two images and all the other ones I'm gonna show you, I wouldn't naturally guess that they were by the same artist. Uh, to me, it looks more like, oh, there was a design competition and all these talented people had their own direction for Taboo. But no, Klinger just had 101 ideas and use them to saturate the, the city with a poster for every taste. So on the left, we're seeing a strong influence of the concept of the new woman that I mentioned before, which was very popular in Germany. The, the idea that a woman could be androgynous rather than traditionally feminine, not classically beautiful. Uh, his women at this point all tend to be a little busted. Um, they often show like crooked or broken noses, really thin lips, these like squinty or like super judgmental eyes and like very strong, like almost Jay Leno style chins. 
Um, he's also playing up the fascination with the exotic. Anything having to do with Asian or African cultures was super fetishized at this time. And many companies align themselves with visual signifiers to capitalize on exoticism. So like also note his wild signature in the lower right corner of that poster and her like insane headdress dripping with jewels. Now contrast this to the image on the right that solely emphasizes the idea of taboo as modernity. Uh, in Vienna at this time, there were no skyscrapers uh, and yet Klinger shows like a sleepy little Hamlet overwhelmed by the presence of a brand new glass tower accompanied by a little biplane encircling it. And this is before the release of King Kong, mind you. Um, and I love the little dude in the lower right corner that's like gazing up like WTF. Um, it's just great. Now, while those images are up, these two posters are also up advertising the same thing. Um, the one on the left is considered the masterpiece in the series because he's taken the brand name, stacked the letters and turned it into this like kind of iconic face, very reminiscent of African masks, the statues of Easter Island, no theater masks, you can kind of connect it to whatever you want. Um, his origin is non-specific but exotic enough uh, that it appeals to that desire for the other. Also, this is just after Freud releases Totem and Taboo, which would not have been lost on viewers at that time, since it was like a bestseller. Um, and another version of this design exists where the A is upside down, so the face becomes like this smiling thing. Uh, it's a really clever and flexible design. Now, on the right is a total departure from the graphics you've seen for Taboo. It's just the T. Uh, this is also around the time that Klinger starts reducing his color palette to just black and red and starts getting more and more minimal with his designs. Now, Klinger also took advantage of new rules regarding poster and advertising placement in uh, Vienna and was like, oh, okay, if there are new rules, I'm gonna follow them, but to the extreme. So if there was a place you could put an ad, Klinger did put an ad. Side of a building, yes. Top of a trolley, of course. Let's put posters around an entire fountain. Uh, so he plastered Vienna with ads for Taboo. Now, I just said that the latter part of his career involved him reducing his color palette to black and red. So some of the last images I'm gonna show you are ones he did for a trade fair known as AHIGA, or a, we say AHIGA, although I know that that probably isn't what it was referred to as. Um, so think of this sort of like a fair where like the latest and greatest stuff for the home, et cetera, are on display, kind of like um, the Armory Antiques Fair, but not antiques. Um, so the three posters I'm going to show you are from this series, and they all target different audiences, but they would have been up at the same time. So saturating the market with something for everyone, essentially. And these posters are really big. The guy with the, with the crab, um, well, actually both of them, um, are about six feet tall, so like my height. Um, and the one with the crab is super weird because the text translates to something colloquial that doesn't really make a ton of sense in English, but it's essentially saying like backward steps and an old fashioned ponytail are the enemies of AHIGA, um, which essentially means nothing old fashioned is gonna be shown here. And then on the right, this poster is basically saying that the prices are going to be the best here. You won't find a better deal. The value will stay firm. Um, so the people who want the latest and greatest and the people who want value and a deal um, are set. And then finally, you have your little Instagram influencer type looking at all the cool baubles she's bought saying, oh my God, original shit is at this place. Um, so essentially, if you want cool stuff, no one else will have, you go to this fair. Um, and again, such variance in design, but all in black and red. Um, and all the messages are, are different, but cohesive as a campaign. So it's a really, really smart move that not really anybody else was doing in posters at this time. Now, Klinger also did a fair amount of international travel and work during the latter part of his career. So on the left is a poster, a uh, very small poster, it's like this, right? Um, advertising a series of lectures he gave at the New School in New York. Uh, he did not speak English, so these were simultaneously translated live, which I'm sure was kind of a bit of a nightmare. Um, and I love that he promotes himself as Europe's most prominent poster artist, which is a total lie. He was absolutely not, but clearly understood the appeal of, of good ad copy. Um, and then on the right is one of two posters he created for the London Underground, where he takes the icon for the subway system there, um, and he turns it into the head of the figure. Um, he was back and forth uh, to the US again, 
um, where he took a position in Detroit for a while, but he quickly left and kind of swore off the United States after that, which was interesting because he used to idolize the United States early in his career because he, he loved our approach to advertising. Um, and then um, in 1938, the Anschluss happened. So Klinger, because he was Jewish, he lost his citizenship in Austria uh, and can no longer legally work. So he taught privately, but did not create posters uh, the last few years of his life. Um, and then in 1942, Klinger and his wife, Emily, were sent to a concentration camp near Minsk, but near Minsk um, and were killed within a week. Um, so that is a very, very itty bitty brief tour of Julius Klinger posters for a modern age, um, a wildly underappreciated poster designer in history. Um, so I, I, I warned Stephanie that I will blow through this lecture really fast because I'm a quick talker. Uh, but I would love to answer any questions you have about posters, about Poster House, about me, whatever you want. Um, lay it on me. So, yep, yeah, perfect. And I will um, stop spotlighting you so everybody can ask questions. And I will ask just one question before we get into it. Um, and then I know Jim's, Jim's already got questions. Uh, I'm going to ask for Zen. She wanted to know if you could talk more, a little more about the process um, of how these posters were printed. So these are all stone lithography, um, which is kind of, it's, it's a complex thing to try to explain how you do, but you basically, you prepare a, a limestone essentially, um, and all the colors are printed separately. It's done through a, an oil water resistance or lots of chemicals involved. Um, but essentially you, you ink usually the lightest color first, let's say the yellow, um, and then you have to redraw like, let's say just the red, then just the blue, and then just the, just the black. And it all has to be, um, the registration has to line up exactly um, or the composition can fall apart. Some designers like Alphonse Mucha, their registration is, is tight, is like insane. Whereas someone like Sheree, if you know who Sheree is, I don't have a Sheree in my house, but you, I've seen ones where like the hair is like not in the lines where the hair is supposed to be. It's like, whoop, but they're posters, they're meant to be thrown away. So the, the precision and um, was it really a priority. Most of the time it was just like getting them up and out. Um, that's like a that's like a very tiny way of exp of explaining stone litho, but it's 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 a it's a dissertation if I try to explain it. I think that uh, got us there. We just needed yeah, perfect. Uh, Jim, go ahead and ask your question. I saw a hand up as soon as we were ready, so go for it. Well, it, I I don't need to know why you were attracted to his work. It's brilliant, but how did you become aware of it? So the, the Wolfsonian Miami had, had a show up and I was like, this looks great. <laughs> I was in Miami, I saw it and I was like, how do we bring this to us? Um, they, the Wolfsonian, if you don't know, it's a great, um, it's a great museum. And I can't even say it's a design museum because it's many things. But uh, Mickey Wolfson, who, st who started it, his collection is incredible. Um, and uh, he often has like great poster shows there. So that is how we formed that. It also gave me like an excuse to go to Miami for a business trip, which was awesome. Thank you. Anytime. Should I be looking at the chat to see if there's questions? No, I have a question that I can ask you. There were two questions. Um, do you take applications for shows? Does the poster have um, to take applications? We do. Currently, we are booked through 2027. Uh, there is like a whole application process. You have to have access to the collection. It has to be original first printings. We don't show reproductions. Uh, if you're a curator, we need, like, if you want to be the curator of the show, you need, we need like a published writing sample, just like the standard stuff that most places would require. Um, but we are booked very far in advance. Good to we book know. about five years in advance, just in case you're like planning. Jim, when are we going to book five years in advance? We're not there yet. <laughs> <laughs> the only way is if we call someone and say, what do you think of uh, 2026? You know, you know you're right. Um, and then another good question was, do you have a very large archive of poster images? Um, we have a, a large archive of posters. Uh, the, the database, we aim for it to be online starting next year, we hope. Um, but it is, we have about, probably about between 10 and 12,000 posters in the collection now. Uh, it grows all the time. I mean, we just started when we were founded in 2019. So it's, it's been a bit, it hasn't been around very long. Um, I collect specifically on, there are a few things we collect. We collect the living archive, which are posters being made now um, by ad agencies all around the world. Um, I'm, I'm particularly uh, a big fan of the ads coming out of Brazil. Um, I think they have like an amazing creative uh, force down there for, but this is like, like ad, ads for like 
kind of like chocolate chip cookies and dog food and stuff like real products. Um, the other thing we do is we buy for shows. So if I'm doing a show on like the history of men's fashion, I will be buying posters advertising to men fashion. Um, so we collect for that. We also, um, we accept donations. Um, so the, the, our collection's a little, it, it's, it's diverse and really interesting. Uh, we also do artist archives. So we have like, um, of course, I forget his name as soon as I, as we, but we have, we have like Milton Glaser's poster archive. We have Seymour Quas poster archive. Um, so we have a lot of different things. Well, and you did start in 2019. So how did it get started? Like what specifically brought about this museum? Um, so I was employee number two, um, but before me, uh, my boss, Julia Knight, was hired by a group of individuals who were really passionate about posters. They noticed that there was no poster museum in the United States, let alone just in New York. Um, and they were like, we would love to, to help start something like that. Um, so that's what we did. And we, we, we were like, poof, and here's a museum. Um, so it, it's kind of a, a bit of a, like a, a Cinderella story for me because I, I, like it was, it's the ideal job for me. I was a poster historian for a decade prior to that. So when, when I heard that there was a poster museum opening, it was like, oh my God, this is meant to be. Um, so yeah. Wonder, I, absolutely amazing. Thank you for um, helping make this happen. Uh, I have some questions, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump to the fangirl one since I have already fangirled. Uh, Sharon and I are both fangirling. I think many of us are fanning. We could be girls it's really, boys. it's hot in New York as long as Yes. <laughs> to just say uh, that uh, your online cocktail and poster presentations in Fireside Chats last year, uh, your knowledge and passion for posters is amazing. So uh, we're all saying thank you so much for all that you share, not just today, but all the time. We have what might be our last posters and cocktails coming up in a few weeks, but we're partnering with the Museum of the Dog. So like that was the other thing during the pandemic, we didn't have a programming person yet. So I was just like, who do I know? Um, and so Nick Lowry, who runs Swan, if you know that auction house in New York, he's on Antiques Roadshow, he's amazing. We're really good friends. So we were like, all right, we have a, a third friend who runs the Green Fairy Society, which is an absinthe society in New York. Obviously they couldn't meet during the pandemic. So we're like, all right, we're gonna do posters and cocktails where I am C, Nico goes through 60 posters based around the theme. And then Don takes that theme and shows you like cocktails. So like Art Deco posters and Art Deco cocktails. So now we're doing dog cocktails. Um, I have to like come up with a bunch of dog facts for the Museum of the Dog about these dogs that Nico's gonna show. Um, but they're like very body because you're dealing with three people who are drinking buddies in person. <laughs> um, so it's, it's, it's fun. Uh, and then the, the um, fireside chats are literally me and Nico once a month on Instagram live. We, um, we share like six of our favorite posters based on a theme. The theme is audience chosen. Um, so it can be weird. But, uh, but yeah, we love it. Um, and if people still like that, please let my boss know because we're trying to figure out if we want to continue doing stuff online now because New York is pretty open. That is an important question. And I even love how you said like they were started casually and that's how the, that's yeah. how ham hangs got started. Um, and I have seen some of these people for a year and a half now and it's lovely because I normally see them in person and once a year. So yes, we- oh, that's awesome. It's nice to see people, um, even if it still has to be digitally. So, so thank yeah. you. Um, I put some links over in the chat for everybody. So if you have not attended those or you need little reminders, they're there. Um, I am going to go back to a couple more questions because we do have some good ones. Um, and if you do want to ask yours out loud, you can also raise your hand if you, <laughs> we like to talk and we're talking quickly. So if you feel like, oh, I can't unmute in time, you can always raise your hand, which is down in reactions. Um, but the question from Zen was, uh, what would be the size of the posters you showed in the presentation? Um, and she's sure they're varied, but can you speak to the size of some of those? Uh, so they are varied, but it might be easier for me to show you. So this is, these are posters in my class. The poster above me would be like all those early horizontals. So I like kind of judge it based on the size of my head. Um, the the Ahigo ones would be bigger. So this poster behind me is like, starts on the floor and goes up. It would be bigger than that, it would be almost six feet tall. Um, this over, this over here is a standard Swiss size. So this would be a little bit larger than what we saw. Um, but most of the German, that's German. And let's see, that's German down there. Um, so the, that, that would be the, do you need like measurements? Cause it's essentially think like two, like three and a half feet by two and a half feet for the smallish ones that were colorful at the beginning. And then they got a little bigger. I think that's a good way. Uh, if I see you unmute, then I'll know. But yeah, I see nodding. So that helps just put it into perspective. I also like comparing posters to the size of heads. <laughs> yeah. 
Instead of horses with hands, it's posters yes. with heads. Um, if these posters are from Hans, if these posters were meant to be outdoors, did they use mm -hmm. any special printing paper that was weather resistant? Um, I mean, hologram instrument use slightly better paper, but most posters are printed on like crappy newsprint. Like they are super thin, they tear super easily. They, they just like fall apart. So it's a miracle that any of these survive. Um, and one thing I always like to say, because people are always like, oh, uh, some dealers do the whole thing like, oh, this was taken off the walls. I'm like, no, buddy, it was not taken off the walls. Have you ever tried to take a wet poster off a wall? That wheat paste will, will, will crumble. Like you'll just get like confetti. Um, every poster that survives today survives through two ways. Either uh, you bought it from a print dealer. So print dealers, particularly one guy named Edmund Sago in Paris, he realized that you could like make a dollar by also selling posters. So he would be in touch with the designers as well as the printing firms um, like Hollerbaum and Schmidt and say, okay, every time Muka makes another poster, give me a runoff of an additional hundred. Um, and some of them will have the advertising copy on them and some won't because some print collectors don't want the lettering, they just want the image, great. So you would buy through a print dealer. The other way, um, is my favorite way, is when it's stolen. And you can tell it's stolen by the presence of, can you see right here, there's like a little stamp. Uh, that is a tax stamp. And if there is a tax stamp on your poster, does not increase or decrease the value, but it does mean it was stolen. Um, so there's hot merchandise in my house. Um, but you would like sneak up behind a bill poster when he wasn't looking and like, Doo -doo -doo -doo. Um, or you would like bribe the bill poster. Um, so that uh, you would get a tax stamp on your poster. Um, if I were a bill poster, I'd go with like my stack to the tax office or whatever, and I would pay some money and then boom, 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 they'd all be stamped so that whoever, the, uh, an official would know that these were pasted legally. Um, so uh, those are the two ways posters survive. Nobody, no poster was ripped off a wall, it, 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 not possible, physics. So what percentage of your collection is stolen? Oh, that's a great question. I don't think I've gone through. Um, it, might, it might just be like, 10%? 10% theft? Is that, I mean, possession is nine tenths of the law. It's mine. All right, so you're um, one tenth. Yeah. That's good. We, um, later I'll get an email. Please cut that portion out of our recording. Yes. No. <laughs> the French government would like to speak with me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, and then to, are there any posters, uh, like, are there any postcards in the archive? Or like, do you guys look at sizes or, yeah. Um, yeah. So we, we only collect posters, um, mm -hmm. and that is, uh, we define a poster as a public facing notice meant to persuade. So it has to advertise something, try to convince you to vote for a candidate, act, like invest in a war bond, something that it has to be causing you to act. Uh, if it says live, laugh, love, that's a print. We do not collect that. Uh, it also has to be public facing. So street facing or like in the case of like an in-store advertising display, like Muka did stuff for cookies that was only ever meant to be displayed indoors or smaller. Um, we'll collect those. Uh, but we don't collect handbills, flyers, broadsides, postcards. Uh, it's not necessarily um, size based because there are broadsides that are big. There are postcards that are big. Well, I guess there are postcards that are big, but there are posters that are small. Um, but the way in which it is used is, is what defines it in, in our mind. And for me, I, especially, like it's also the marriage of word and image. So if the text is printed separately, that kind of sticks it into a slightly different category for me. The, 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 the lettering has to be part of the composition. Okay. Uh, and actually, I was uh, talking a little bit about where you studied, but do you, you talked a little bit when, before we got started about broadsides versus posters. Do you even mind touching on that a bit? It's a controversial subject mm -hmm. um, among broadside people. Um, but uh, no, broadside is, it's, it's more, so what, um, what is behind Jim, I would consider more of a broadside. It is, uh, usually it's, uh, uh, usually it's using mechanized type in some way as opposed to this. Um, it's one of those things like I, I know when I see it, it's harder to explain, but usually it is, the, it requires the marriage board of an image versus just the presentation of information um, with a tip on or, or an image treated as race type. Wonderful. Um, ah, so let's see, I'm going to, thank you very much. Sorry, my brain went <laughs> two places at once. <laughs> that was exactly what I wanted to know. And um, I think we like it when there's a little controversy when we talk about prints or posters. Um, I will actually, yeah, I'm gonna spotlight you for a minute, Jim, um, because that way we can see that. And then we'll get back to a couple questions for Angelina. Jim, do you wanna say where we got that this week yet or not? 
Sure. Um, this came from uh, John Horn, who is a friend of the museums and, uh, uh, and a collector. And so it's, um, it's great because, let me see if I can improve the, uh, the copy for you here. It's big. This is a two sheeter. So it's a yeah, it's pretty awesome. two by 40. Before we all began, I was, um, this is better. So this is the agricultural society's piece, but you know, lots and lots of text, a balloon going off with a live animal that will return safely to earth. Um, velocipede race, horse speed. I guess I'm a little too close. That's better. I, this is big. I, I like the moving poster display. Who doesn't? <laughs> Balloon ascension. Yes. Right. So, um, and no information about it available whatsoever. But this was uh, an event in Norwich, Connecticut. And we know that the type maker William Page was also from Norwich. So you can probably guess where all of this type came from. But a nice piece, even if it is a broadside. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that, Jim. I appreciate it. I uh, figured a, a little pause for a broadside would be allowed. OK. Let's see. And then um, there was a question about where he studied, which you did talk a little bit about, Angelina. Um, Sorry, off the top of my head, I don't know the name of the school. Yeah. But, um, but I know it was, a, you went to technical school, not, not the Arts Academy in, in Berlin. So that's all I got. No, that's great. Um, in fact, I'm even gonna pop over to the idea. Someone asked if you would talk about an upcoming exhibition um, because I know I'm not the only one and Frank's not the only one who likes push pin. Um, so yes. will you talk about that for a bit? Yes, um, so in our main gallery, so where Klinger is now, um, opening on September 2nd, um, will be uh, the Pushpin Legacy. It, it, got, it covers like obviously the origins of Pushpin and then where how all of those designers kind of went on to shape um, illustration advertising in New York City and beyond. So it has obviously the great Milton Glaser, but it also has co-founder Seymour Quast, um, Ed Sorrell, um, uh, Paul Davis, um, the, the Reynold Ruffins who just passed away two days ago, um, Jim McMullen who does all of Lincoln Center's advertising, uh, so it has a lot of these amazing designers um, who who just I, I just love them. Um, so, but it's also a, everyone's always afraid that it's going to be just about one artist, but it's, it really is about the entire group as a whole. We mentioned over ninety nine people that were affiliated with Pushpin um, in the exhibition, so it's great. We also have because um, not everybody made posters who was affiliated with them, so we have like campaign bu buttons. They did the the buttons for for Javits's reelection campaign, and they're wild. Um, they there's um, there are album covers, there are book jackets where you can take books off the shelf and like look at how they either illustrate an entire book or just the book jacket. Um, and they're all the, the original ones that you can touch because um, we don't collect books. Um, but, uh, um, but yeah, so it's a, it's a really beautiful and varied show. And I'm, I'm really, and I, I got to work with all the living designers. Like every, if, you, if they were alive and affiliated with Pushpin, they went through me. Um, so it's a lot of firsthand accounts. It's, um, it's just a really great show. And about how long does it take to put that together? Because it's huge. Um, well, um, <laughs> it's about, so I, uh, rather than days and months, it's probably easier for me to explain in time. So an average show for me takes between 700 and 900 hours to, to research and write. Um, I don't sleep. <laughs> um, but that, that is approximately what it would take to do a show like that. I also, a lot of that was was dealing with people with like firsthand accounts of, of their time there. So it was more interviews, less like less hanging out in the library. Something like Muka was hanging out in the library. Obviously, I'm not talking to Alphonse Muka, who was dead. Um, but it, it varies from show to show. Like with the Amos Kennedy show, that's like much, much smaller. But I flew out to Detroit and I held the poster and asked about every poster, and that and that became the show. Um, so it it can be different um, depending on what show we're doing. I think that's lovely, the opportunity to be able to work oh, in yeah. so many different ways. Yeah. Yeah. Both yeah, yeah. For we, also you. The, we also recorded all of the interviews with the, with the pushpin uh, designers. So, which I think is like amazing to have like the actual firsthand account recorded um, from some of these guys. 
Will that be uh, part of the exhibition as well as shared online, or how do the does that information um, get? I don't think the audio. I don't think the audio will be part of the exhibition. It just wasn't part of the. It's also not the greatest audio because we started doing the recordings right at the beginning of the pandemic, so only one of them is in person, and then the rest over a cell phone are like really poor audio quality. Um, but uh, but oh, I see someone asked, how does the work of Amos Kennedy fall into your definition of posters? Excellent question, Ray. We only used his advertising posters. Uh, that was the, the my big thing. So when we, I was in Detroit, I went through like all of his boxes of things and I found posters actually advertising events. Um, so concerts, uh, charity events, um, and anything and everything. I, if it was advertising something, that was the criteria to for it to be a public facing notice meant to persuade as opposed to any of his other amazing prints. Amos is very good at persuading people to do things and whether yeah. it's for an event or not. <laughs> he can persuade me to do anything. He's the best. <laughs> um, let's see, we do have a question. Will, uh, will there be a catalog for Pushpin? We are at creating a new catalog because there are endless books on all of Pushpin. We will, Seymour is having a new book that's really gonna be released around the same time. Um, every, every, basically all of those designers have a book and they will all be available. <laughs> Um, and someone just uh, gave me a question, how or do you do in-house preservation of these posters? Um, so we don't have an in-house um, restorer, if that's what you're asking. We use poster conservation in Stanford, Connecticut, primarily. We have also used M&W Graphics in Long Island City. Um, both are poster restorers that I've, I've worked with for over 16 years, so they are the best, I think they're the best. Um, and they, all, all the posters typically, uh, any, anything pre-1960 would be linen backed. I know that's not the European preference, but um, it is the most durable way to, to preserve a poster in my opinion. And, it, and it, it's reversible. So if we really wanted to take it off, we could. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I'm big on linen backing. Um, we tend to, unless it really needs to look perfect, less restoration for me is more in a museum context. In a, it, when I was working at a, a gallery, more restoration is more because um, you want it to look beautiful in someone's home. But um, I'm in, in a museum context, I'm of the opinion that we want to see how these objects were used. Um, so seeing the wear on some of them is important. Um, but uh, but yes, that's that's what we do. I love it. You're good at this rapid fire. They're firing them off and you're, you're doing a great job. Thank you. <laughs> um, in fact, there is one that says, do you have any collection criteria regarding artist periods or movements, which? No. Oh. <laughs> um, so we, we, I mean, we collect to display, so we don't collect stuff we're never going to show, generally speaking. Um, there's an exception to every rule, as all of you know, there are exceptions to all the rules. Um, but um, as far as time period, I don't usually date posters as starting prior to 18, mid 1860s. So I wouldn't really go earlier than that, because then you're just hitting the broadside situation, which is not what we're like, you need, you need color lithography to have a poster, in my opinion. Um, so in, until that happens, we don't, we don't collect it. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so that, that would be the only like hard cutoff. We go to the present day, every country has a poster. Like there is no, every country is advertising. Um, so there, there, we did do a show. Um, the second show I did in the major gallery was, um, a show on Ghanaian hand-painted movie posters. Um, so it was American imported film um, and, and the, the movie posters they created that traveled with essentially like this almost traveling circus style of cinema where they would like roll it up, roll it out. So it functioned as a poster and that was public facing, but it wasn't pasted. It was like a banner essentially, it was painted. Um, so that kind of definitely goes outside of the traditional definition of what is a poster because it's a painting, it's not a printed multiple, um, which is usually essential to that definition for me. But Countries that are that don't have printing presses can't do that. So we needed to broaden that definition in those cases so that we could um, incorporate them into our uh, programming schedule. Um, so there's always a way around something, but it just has to be a compelling story. That's very, very good information to know. Uh, and I feel like this is an, a good insider question. Who do you recommend as a poster framer in New York City? Ooh. Uh, so the museum uses AMCI in Long Island City. They, they do like every museum's framing. They're great. I, I use them for everything behind me was framed by AMCI. Um, but uh, the, I, I'm a, a per, personally, anything I get framed now, since I, I can't like send it to the museum framer because that's like a conflict or something. Um, I use the, I use the, I don't know the name of it, but there's a framer across the street from me on 82nd and Lex. 
and they are great because they send it to AMCI. Um, but uh, but yeah, they're, they're great. Um, so AMCI is really who you want to go to. Ask for Beatrice. See, that's the kind of things we need uh, in ham hangs <laughs> is who to ask for. Yes, they're great. So I have to say we're caught up on questions, but we can be quiet for just a second. If there's anyone who wants to unmute, I think sometimes it's tough to feel free. I'll see you unmute. You can ask a question or if we have any last question or two in the, put them in the chat. Awesome. Jim is quick on the unmute. Ooh. Tom's. <laughs> well, I had a lot of questions before we started, but you've shown a little bit of your collection, but I'm just curious. I know that there's lots more that we probably can't see a tour of your house, but I'm just curious about personally what you like to collect. Are, are you not aware of the house tour of mine that's available online? No. Um, it's, wow. uh, Stephanie, if you Google, I think it's called Homeworthy. Um, there is a tour of my house somewhere in there you can put in the chat. It, a, a friend of mine contacted me, they're like, You're, you don't suck on camera. Would you like to be on Homeworthy? I'm like, sure. Um, but uh, the stuff I collect, there's no rhyme or reason to my collecting goal. It's not like I'm collecting only circus posters or something like that. I'm just attracted to what I'm attracted to. Um, there are, it's just weird. So like the one behind me, this is by Capiello, the father of modern advertising. Uh, my dad got this for me because he thought it looked like me doesn't look like me. Um, this one I got, here, we're going we're gonna to do it. We're going to do this. Um, this one is a Swiss poster advertising a railroad buffet. Um, and it looks exactly like my dad. He does this face. This, this, this is my father in 2D form. It's amazing. Um, then I have posters mostly for bars and there's a lot of food and wine. I'm a certified sommelier. So like wine is very important to me. Um, then if we go over here, you will see the, that this is a poster for pate, but the or foie gras, but the, uh, the little goose, the queen goose, she's like staring down at her dead husband in the can. I'm really morbid and kind of, I'm kind of weird. Um, in my bedroom, there's a lot of posters for syphilis, which I think says a lot about my sense of humor um, as a single woman. Um, but, uh, but yeah, there, and then my, my TV room, it's all like bad girls posters. So like lip fast, die young and snow bunnies. Um, so it's a lot of like soft core porn. Um, it's, it's an eclectic household. Um, I just like weird stuff. And yes, to Elizabeth, we do have an internship program at Poster House. Uh, it's advertised, it, it'll sh I think it starts getting advertised in November on our website. It'll be a, it has a whole website page. Um, so that, that is that. That was amazing. I did post that link. Um, and with most outdoor vertical surfaces kept clean these days, what forums and venues are there now for posters? Like where are we seeing posters? Um, every post no bills wall has the bills posted. Um, there, there are like wild posting campaigns where like people put them up on the illegal surfaces, but it's kind of all regulated. Um, there are, I, I think actually a lot of music venues still do, do, do like, like if you go out to Seattle or Portland, like the amount of telephone poles they're used to promote music concerts. Um, I know we, I, yesterday I had like this epiphany where I was like, there are no, there are no telephone poles in Manhattan. How do we have telephones? Um, which I, I'm sure there's a, there's something to justify that. I don't know the answer, science. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so like designers like Mike King, the most prolific gig poster artist of all time. Um, he would, has like, his posters would be on, on telephone poles. Um, and that's how you would see these great graphics. Um, I think it's, it's, it's uh, I mean, posters are also pretty limited to cities. They are the language of city streets. You do not see them in the countryside. Um, although a favorite thing of mine to do, um, if I go to like a museum that is like encyclopedic, you go find like the paintings from the late 1800s, early 1900s section. Um, and you find like some really boring genre painting and you'll see like two milkmaids going down the street and then there'll be like a little poster in the background and I spend like three weeks trying to identify it. Um, so, but they're in the countryside. So clearly these things did extend beyond major cities because they wouldn't have existed. Um, but yeah, I love finding posters in um, paintings or in movies. I, I have, Nico and I will text each other when we're watching a movie and we find a poster. I'll be like, Godfather, Cinzano poster. <laughs> um, 
yeah. That's amazing. We, um, I have to admit, we letterpress printed at the beginning. I started here 10 years ago and any event poster we did for the museum were letterpress printed. And we started to find that we did have collectors. People would steal them because they were the coolest posters in Two Rivers, Wisconsin. <laughs> right. We've now gone digital because we have less time, uh, but it was fun for a long time. Um, let's see, we are going to be wrapping up, but there's a curious question about with, will digital and animated posters be collected and be part of the collection? Um, so TBD, my opinion is no. It, the, if there is a subsequent poster curator, their opinion might be different. Um, reason for no for me is printing is so integral to a poster for me that a digital, digital signage is not that. Digital signage can be great, but it is not about printing. Um, which is very important to me when it comes to a poster. Um, that and also ar archiving digital is insane. You have to have like a dedicated server. You have to update that 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 every time, um, like there's a software update. You actually have to update all of those files, and in 30 years they could be completely not usable. So it's it's actually incredibly hard to store and preserve digital. Kind of more so than it is to store and preserve like a piece of paper from 100 years ago. Um, so that is my opinion on digital posters, which is not a popular opinion. Um, uh, yeah. I see some Zen wants to know about non-Latin scripts. Do you just mean anything that isn't English really? Or, or your or romance language? Yeah, we have uh, Russian posters. Uh, the Stenberg brothers did some of the greatest posters coming out of the, out of the Soviet Union. Uh, we have one in our permanent poster history timeline at the museum. Um, they're a fave. They, I did my masters on them, um, but uh, but if you but we also did a show on Chinese posters uh, right after the Ghanaian show. Um, so I think and we, we have a show coming up in about two years I think on Japanese posters. Um, so there are every country has a poster. Um, so that, that, that I hope answers that. I think that's a really good way to wrap up. I want right. to say, Angelina, thank you so much for everything you shared today. Absolutely amazing. You got all of your fans to, uh, not all your fans, but our, our Hamilton fans got to come. Hamilton in fans. So thank you so much. I no, it was awesome. Wonderful day. Um, and thank Bye, you guys. so much. And I'm going to do some Hamilton updates. So thank you, Angelina. <clears throat> Thanks, Angelina. And Steph. Yeah. Uh, well, we have exciting news at the museum. Um, if you didn't get 14 emails from me this week, or if they went to your um, uh, uh, promotional, so I heard a lot of Gmail people were like, I didn't get emails. They, they might have gone to your promotionals tab, which is the worst. Come on, Gmail. Um, we have some exciting things. And the biggest one is to say that Waze Goose has opened. So you can go register for Waze Goose right now. And the reason I would highly recommend rec uh, signing up for Waze Goose right now is we're having our first ever early bird special. So we have worked to make a really cool packet. If you got the packet last year, it was full of goodies. Um, we didn't want to, we wanted to outdo ourselves. So we found um, Chanel letters. Is that how they... Uh, chenille letters, the fuzzy letters with the Hamilton logo is one of the goodies you get in their goodie bag. Um, bumper stickers, personalized field notes. Jim is printing many, many, many thousands of coasters. Oh, yeah. Thousands. <laughs> thousands. Um, so we, and you can get it all for $100 instead of 130 but we only have 100 of those. And I have been watching very closely and the number is getting higher and higher. So if you're like, yes, I'm coming to Waze Goose. Yes, I want that packet. Now's the time to sign up. Um, let's see. Oh, there's a print exchange. So if any of you are printers and <laughs> none of you are printers, anyway, and you want to do an exchange, um, we are partnering with Partners in Print, PIP. And they have organized this exchange, which is amazing. We've never done an exchange at Hamilton. They've done some really amazing exchanges already. So it's celebrating all types. And there's only 50 spots. Um, so you can see that on the registration page as well. Um, we're really excited about that because the idea is we get to see some beautiful pieces. It is international. Uh, so Zen, if you're not busy, you can also sign up for the, <laughs> for the exchange. I only call you out because I like you. Um, and then uh, our normal things that we're doing, we do, we're going to continue to do Hamilton hangs next Friday is party day. So it's not going to be at noon, you can enjoy your normal lunch hour without us watching you. Uh, instead, we're going to have a party. So on Friday, we're going to be 
Friday, July 23rd at 6 p.m. Central. It's the summertime print party. And what that means is we wanna see what you're up to. If you're printing stuff, if you've printed stuff uh, recently, if you're in the middle of a job, uh, we'd love to share it with us. I think it'd be good. Um, I'll either be on in my backyard uh, with my feet up around the barbecue or I'll be in our print room so that if I have to steal any posters and show what Jim's working on, we can do that. So next Friday, the 23rd at 6 p.m., our ham hang is celebrating you, celebrating summer. Let us know what you're up to. Uh, have something on your barbecue if you want. And the only other thing I'll share is Jim still teaching workshops and we have online ones. So David Wolski's did fill, but he's allowing us to do a couple waitlisted. So if you wanna know about isotype printing, there are just a couple more spots in his. And um, I will say there are spots in Heather Mulder's Sintra Board Secrets Workshop in August, which is August 21st. I have taken this workshop in person. It is amazing. Heather Mulder works at Hat Show Print. And yes, you can carve lino. Yes, you can carve wood. Have you ever tried Sintra? Um, it's a pretty amazing material. They use it there at Hatch. Heather uses it a ton. You can do pressings into it. You can do carvings into it. Um, so if you are intrigued by printing with a new material, I highly recommend that workshop. So I just covered a lot in under five minutes. Thank you for letting me do it quick. <laughs> um, and I want to say thank you. I'm so glad you all joined us today. <laughs>